Hello and welcome to the fifth season of the Utah Puck Report. I can't believe we're here. I got Evan Stoffel is our co-host today. Evan, how are you? I'm doing good. Glad to be back after I don't know, two, three year hiatus, maybe. Yeah. So I mean, you uh, you kind of retired from being a player. Uh, we had a rough go with COVID as far as trying to coordinate getting you in the studio or actually even getting me in the studio. Most of the time, we're not even near the studio, and. Uh, is this our first time back in the studio? I'm asking my producer, Josh, and he doesn't know either. It feels like it is. Yeah, so this might be our first official time back in the studio since COVID. Um, so anyway, it's it's amazing to be back. It's amazing not to be on Zoom. And, uh, you know, we talk a lot about Utah hockey. I mean, that's all we're supposed to talk about, right? Yep. And for at least the entire time we've had this broadcast, I've been trying to get Chris Billiter on the show because – the bulk of what Utah hockey is, is men's league and county rec. And through whatever hurdles, we finally got Chris on the show. Chris Billiter, thank you for being on the show. Thanks for having me. I'm glad we could make it work. So Chris, you're the hockey coordinator for Salt Lake County Parks and Rec. Yes. And, at the, I'm, and I'm located at the Acord Ice Center. And you're at the Acord. So tell us a little bit about what your job entails. So you're, you just, you're at Acord, but that doesn't mean you just take care of Acord. That, that is correct. So um, I have responsibilities at a court. Um, you know, I run, we, we have youth league, adult league. I have staff that I'm over that are in charge of the building when we're not there. So we have part-time staff that cover the building. Um, drive the Zamboni, sharpen skates, you know, oh, wow. order pro shop stuff. Yeah, I have a lot. It's you quite a bit I do. Yeah. yeah. So the, the adult league, I'm the league administrator for the Salt Lake County Adult Hockey League. Okay. Um, now that I want to get into. Because that's where I think again that's we have tons. Of, any idea off the top of your head how many registered adult league players there are? Um, well, you figure we'll have thirty four teams this winter, and you figure each team has anywhere from fifteen to twenty players rostered. Oh wow! So, but does it does it count if Ben Wilner's on all the teams? I mean, that drops <laughs> that'll drop <laughs> the total amount of guys down, right? There, there are a few players that like to play on more than one team, but we have a rule in the league where you can only play up or down a division. So, so there's a few guys that play uh, play more than it. once, and that's a lot of hockey. Up actually. and down, and yeah. in the middle. Yeah, I'm like, <laughs> I'm too old to do that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, me too. So I want to talk. I want to tell your story a little bit before we just get into county hockey. Um, you know, a lot of times guys are like, "Well, that dude doesn't." Well, I'm not saying about you, but. A lot of times people think whoever the county guy is in any state, they're like, well, it would have been nice if he was a hockey player. We have the the luxury that you were a hockey player. You grew up here playing. Tell us a little bit about your playing history. Um, so I, so I, my my parents and grandparents used to go to the old Golden Eagle games. Oh, yeah. So I, I, that's, if it wasn't for the Golden Eagles, I wouldn't be sitting here right now talking to you. Um, when I was six years old, I told my parents I wanted to play hockey. And so they put me in skating lessons. And a year later, when I was seven, I started playing, playing in, uh, the old Slaha. I, uh, um, that was the 75, 76 season. So wow. a long time ago. Yeah. Um, when we only had Hygieia, the Salt Palace and Bountiful. Jeez. Yeah. So a long time. Um, my first year I played, I played for, uh, there were sponsors for teams, and I played for a team called Howard Johnson's. So okay. I scored one goal that season. So <laughs> I still remember that. You always remember the first goal. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, I never then, scored one, so I still don't know. Then uh, then after that, I um, I, I started, um, we, I played house league, and I would also play travel. So my second year of whatever division I was in, I would play A team. The first year I'd usually play like the B team. So, um, in 82, I was on our, the Utah Wee travel team. We went to nationals. We were the first team ever to go to nationals from, from Utah. So that was pretty cool. Yeah, so, that is cool. Long time ago. So any, uh, any legends come off that team besides you, of course? Um, nobody that ever went too far. Okay. So, but there was a lot of talent. There was, um, I think there was a few that probably played some, you know, junior hockey, maybe some college, and maybe a little minor pro, but nothing. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, that's still pretty good. Yeah. Hockey so, was so, like, in its beginning stages for Utah back then. It was. I mean, we had one travel team. You know, now it's way different. So. Yeah, and that's something we're actually going to talk about, too. <laughs> yeah. Wait, Evan Stoffel, you're coaching. Tell the, us a, Wasatch ahead. Renegades. So, recently um, changed the name. Obviously, it's a little more fitting to Utah, I never quite understood the West Coast thing, but 
whatever. Um, <laughs> I'm the director, and I'm coaching the 14U and 16U teams this season. Okay. And it's a completely different picture of what you're coaching now compared to what travel team was or what like this tournament level style was back then when Chris was playing. And that's something, as the season progresses, we're going to get really in-depth when we're talking about Utah hockey, and we're going to really kind of crush that and figure out what is AAA hockey, what is AA hockey, and kind of get rid of some of the myths. So we'll have you talk about your program, and uh, we're just lucky that you're you're available to be on the show a bunch this year. I don't know if you know you're going to be on the show a bunch this year, but we're, we're grateful that you're going to be. Sure. Yeah, I've always f- had fun in the past, and why not build on it? So, Chris, as you as you kept moving on uh, through hockey, um, did you play high school hockey here? I did. I played high school hockey, went to Brighton. Okay. Played um, three years of high school hockey, took state my junior year at Brighton. So that was kind of fun. That was kind of a highlight. Um, and then... Also growing up as well, when I turned 13, I started refereeing hockey. Okay. So I've refereed a lot of years. Um, I got about 29 years of officiating under my belt. I haven't officiated in probably the last five, six years, but I got 29 years, which is a long time. So I've seen the game from a lot of different aspects. So I need you to come back. Yeah. <laughs> There's not enough refs anymore. <laughs> yeah, that's another thing we need to talk about. So when, as, you were, as you were officiating, why did you stop officiating? You know, it, I have a full-time job working at the rink these days, so I spend 40 hours a week at a rink, and um, that's I think that's really what it comes down to because I'm, I'm I'm hockey all the time, so yeah. I kind of need I need I need I need a little bit of a break from it in my off time. So, so you mean there's something else in somebody's life besides hockey? A, a <laughs> hockey player that doesn't think hockey 24 <laughs> seven. Well, you know, I always think hockey, but you know. My question is, and like what Evan was saying, is 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 now. Uh, with you being the program coordinator for hockey here, officiating is such a big deal. And for a while, it just was like, you know, you you would have a hard time getting three officials, and now you're having a hard time getting two officials. And now um, the abuse of officials that's gone on, is that what you contribute to having a hard, hard time getting officials? That's why I was wondering if that's why you quit or if it was just time for you to step away. Yeah, th- no, I didn't, I didn't quit because of that. I, I have, um, I, like I said, I, I, I'm getting older and I just spend a lot of time at the rink. And so that's why I just I don't officiate. Plus, if I did, I wouldn't be doing county stuff either. So if I officiate, it's got to be something non-county. Okay. And so it's just where I'm at in my life at the moment. Um, but as far as the – as far as uh, – officiating and as far as officials it's always been i over the years it's kind of been a cycle it seems like there's you know always there's at times there's too many then there's not enough and we kind of seem to be at that it's not enough again um and i think there's a number of factors um i think hockey's increased around here yeah so there's a bigger demand for officials um back in the day there was not near as much hockey Um, now there's a ton of hockey you can really pick and choose what you want to referee um, abuse of officials is a big deal. There are officials that don't want to work because they don't like the abuse. And um, USA Hockey's really tried to crack down on things, and so has Solly County. We've really tried to put things in place and make it more difficult for the problem players to want to play. Uh, okay. You know, if we can make it harder for those guys to play, then maybe we'll have more officials and maybe we'll have more people wanting to play, right? Can you step us through that a little bit? I, I saw recently, uh, I don't know how I ended up on the email chain, but you were sending out an email saying, hey, we've got a disciplinary board coming up. We need some non-biased people. I'm, I'm always biased, by the way, so yeah. you should probably just take me off that list. I, <laughs> I already have my mind made up before I even know who, what's going on. But anyway, it, it, we have the disciplinary board. We have these other ways of handling this. Um, and I've noticed with soccer – you know, my son's a soccer player. I hate to admit that, but uh, I've noticed with soccer, they're really gearing towards, like, you get one warning as a player or especially the fans. You get one warning, and then we'll just forfeit your team. And I, I read an article this morning about with football, the uh, the officials are now, if a parent yells something or if a kid swears at a ref, that's automatic. That's 10 yards unsportsmanlike. And they were talking about 
an official that walked a team. A coach kept yelling, and they kept just walking 10 yards back, 10 <laughs> yards back to their, their goal line. And he says, your next, the next word is a forfeit. And it seems like you almost have to come out of the gate heavy-handed on the abuse now. Is there – do you have plans in place for that now or – you know, we keep we keep uh, tweaking things as needed. We keep adding things and making things, you know, harder um, for players. Like I say, the problem players to want to play. We got new rules coming into place. So the game's ever changing, and so rules are ever changing in some in some aspects. Um, what you could say and could do years ago, you can't now. I mean, you can't say you can't do anything derogatory, discriminatory. Um, you know, threatening and all that. You can't do that anymore. It's not accepted, which right. it shouldn't be. Um, and we have to remind, you have to remind the adults that, hey, if you don't treat the officials right, we're not going to have officials to work games. And then we don't have a league. Yeah. So they really got to think twice um, about some of the things they say and they do. Um, any kind of violent action against an official is usually at least a year minimum. If yeah. you're found guilty of that. How do you feel about Do you feel that should be a year minimum, or do you feel like that should be a lifetime ban? Every circumstance is different. I, I feel like a, okay. a year a year minimum, depending on what it is, um, If depending on the severity, it could be worse than that. Yeah. You know, and some cases, maybe a lifetime ban. I don't know. The I can – well, I guess that wasn't a, a, an against an official, but I, I remember my senior year in high school, we had a player here – uh, go two handed across a two handed slash across the guy's helmet and broke his helmet off. It was Trevor Lewis's dad. Yes. The guy hit in the head. Yes. And it was one of our best players of the time. And he got a lifetime ban. And I thought, man, that's that's excessive, but man, does that send a message like it was it was a that was that was probably one of the, the worst things that uh, that happened years ago. So yeah. yeah. And I still still remember that. I wasn't in charge at that time, but I was I was involved in hockey around here, obviously, in some facet or another during that time, refereeing and stuff. But so I heard all about it. And I played hockey with Randy. I used to play with the spa when I graduated high school. I played a couple of seasons with the spa. Yeah. Um, before I went to playing no check because the spa was playing check hockey back then, and so I played with Randy. So yeah, yeah, great guy. So I was, absolutely great guy. And the guy that. That whacked him. I knew him. I knew his family and everything else. I was shocked that yeah. he did that, but it was not acceptable. And right. Randy still has issues from it. I know that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was, that was horrible. And yeah, I, so what does it take now to get into a disciplinary meeting? What is it? Is it a gross? Is it a major? What match penalty? A match penalty. Anything is a match penalty, but there's a lot of things that are match penalties these days. So, so let's list a few. Um, any, like say, uh, anything that's threatening, derogatory, discriminatory, any of those things. So, you know, you, you, you throw a racial slur at somebody that could be a match penalty, remove somebody else's helmet, match penalty. Yeah. Now, some of these for like maybe something derogatory like that or a helmet, we, we kind of have some rules in place where like it's a two game, you know, like a two game suspension, but then you're on year probation. So if you get a game misconduct during that year of probation, then you're suspended from our league for a year. So you don't want to get a match penalty in, our, right. you know, in, in any league. But in our league, if you do, you're on probation. You know, once you've served your suspension, you're on probation for a year. And you violate that probation by getting as simple as a game misconduct. You're not going to play in our league for a year. Yeah. Is it, it's mind-boggling to me. And Evan, Evan, we were just talking about you coming out and playing men's league, and you're like, not a chance. Yeah. And why is that? Because of even when I was the last time I actually played men's league, I think yeah. it was in college, and without fail there'd be, you know, getting whacked in the back of the legs or, <clears throat> you know, people trying to prove, I don't whatever the reason is, and it's just unnecessary and something that you just don't want to deal with. And even then when I was late teens, early 20s, I never understood why, you know, guys that are we always call them real jobs or you know a nine to five why you want to show up with a black eye or stitches across your face from something very avoidable and pointless yeah and just so you can tell everybody you're a hockey player yeah and now i never lost any teeth playing hockey i don't want to in men's league so i just had enough surgeries and all that stuff from playing 
actual competitive, you know, hockey that it's just that just doesn't sound fun to me. Yeah, so you hit the nail on the head. That's why I asked you because for me it's just it's mind boggling to me and I'll see it like it drop in or honestly, if you play men's D one, it's usually cleaner. And then when you play well, not to throw a league out under the bus here, but like I'll go out and sub in at that oval. And I'll play in some of their games. And those are the dirtiest games I've ever played in. And you'll get in the locker room and a guy will be like, see when I threw that hit? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, it's so easy to hit somebody in a no-check league and catch them off guard because it's against the rules. Mm -hmm. Do you really think that made you cool? Like, how? it's just like the shooting fish in a barrel or whatever. These hunters that go out and they're like, oh, there's an antelope tied to that tree right there, shoot it. Because it's, there, there's no sport in hitting somebody that, in a no-check league. And there's, you're definitely not tougher because you did it. It's just pathetic, really. And is is there, if as you've watched this over your career, if you could have a chance, and this is it right here, if you had a chance to say to the entire league, like, what would your message be? Like, what do you want them to think about as they're signing up and playing men's hockey? Well, that's, a, yeah, and... I'll tell you, and I've said this over over the years. I mean, we we this, it's supposed to be fun for one, and the thing that remember is this: we're not getting paid to do this. Everybody has a job. Everybody yeah. has a family and everything else. You want to be able to go to your job the next day after playing last night or the day before, whatever. You know, you don't want you don't want to be hurt. You don't want to be going to the the ER. I mean, now accidents happen. People are going to get hurt just playing, but when it's intentional, that's a totally different story, and. um that's just not fun. I mean, it, it's all about having fun because if it's, something's not fun, you're not going to do it. Yeah. So you want to you want to feel like you can go to something and enjoy yourself and have a good time and hopefully not get hurt um, from somebody playing dirty. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I had a guy uh, uh, like three weeks ago. I was uh, just a, a private skate and a kid that I know. He's he's an all right kid and he's uh, a decent player. And I was like, oh, it's weird to see you out here. And he's like, yeah, I'm banned from all the other leagues right now. i got to take hockey wherever I can get it. And I was like, why, why are you banned? Were you saying, were you talking to the officials or were you just being cheap? And he goes, oh, a little of both. And I'm like, wow, must make you proud, bud. Like, here you are. Like, th- literally, I'm the youngest guy normally at this skate at almost 50 years old. And here you are at 24. And this is the only ice you can get now because... You can't figure it out in your head. Like, I guess a lot, I go to ice, I call it my therapy, and I guess maybe maybe you guys have way more issues than I'm thinking about, and this is their therapy, so the only way they can work it out is to hit Evan in the back of the legs with their stick, or, yeah, anyway, that's just one of the things I, I wanted to get out there, is that, man, just think about it. If you're signing up for men's league, you want to go out and have fun, it should be fun for all of us at the same thing. We're all just out there, make a good pass, score a good goal. Uh, you know, be proud that you you can still do a left and a right crossover or that you made that transition from forward to backwards and you didn't fall down. Like, just be thrilled with that. Or that you're wearing your stupid eye watch and get off and be like, wow, my heart rate was 170 for 42 minutes. I'm more healthy now. Mm-hmm. And hockey's awesome. Yeah. Instead of getting out there and cheap shotting everybody. It just seems to me like that makes more sense. Now everybody listening is like, Jay, but I've heard you yell at refs for 20 plus years or whatever. And that's just because my voice stands out. And I I had a tendency to yell, but not, I don't know. I don't think I was ever derogative. I always like to have more fun with my insults than make them, you know. Yeah, there's a a line. Yeah. Yeah. But I don't think anyone would want me on their men's league team because I would only throw sauce passes and it wouldn't be, yeah. I I remember uh, Ben getting mad at you for just throwing sauce passes for a while or shooting at our own goalie. That was funny, though. That yeah. Was all- <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I did told it. him. I told <laughs> him I was going to do it. So. <laughs> I would never see that coming. So, Chris, now now we're talking about the cheap shots, but what about the uh, abusive officials? Do you, You're you getting it from players. You're getting it from just idiots in the stands. Is yeah. That, is that still as much of a problem as I think it is or no? You know, I think the, the USA Hockey and the rule changes and things we've added are, are helping helping curb some of that. I think it's getting better. Okay. We're still not where we're still not where we'd like to be, right? But we're getting there. So and we keep tweaking things as we need to. Um, we 
you know, new rules. We got we got new rules going in place this this winter. So what are those? Are, what's what's so so one of the one of the rules this winter that's going into place is um, you know your first your first game misconduct in the league you serve your game. Your second game misconduct, whether you're playing on two teams or one, whatever, you're going to get three additional games for that game misconduct. So you're going to serve like four games. You're going to have to serve the four games for that team you got that second game misconduct on. And you can't play on that other team until you've served those four games. And in addition to that, you're now going to be placed on probation for a year. So during that year probation, if you get a game misconduct, you're going to be suspended from our league for a year. Okay. And the idea behind this is, is you know, so everybody's entitled to probably one one doing something wrong, but it ta- doing it twice in a season, no, that takes some work, you know. No. As far as I'm concerned, it takes work, you know. So that's the idea behind this is to once again try to weed out the the players that are causing problems, the troublemakers, because it it really takes one person on a team that can that's causing problems and it kind of just escalates every everybody on that team and it's is it always just, brothers it seems like it's always brothers that are <laughs> i'm not gonna name any names but there's a few sets of brothers i'm definitely not gonna say it's the mannix because they don't do that anymore right last time i remember was in vegas okay well <laughs> that probably wouldn't count but anyway um and, and the, there's other sets of brothers that always seem like to me it always seems like ah those brothers are on that team or those other brothers are on that team. And they're the ones that are always, one of them escalates and then the other one finishes. And it's like, there's always problems with brothers. Uh, I don't see it so (laughs) much with the brothers, but we have had in the past, we have had um, siblings that, and it still happens where it's a sibling, you know, or, or a, uh, uh, a parent and a a young and a child that's old enough to play adult league, you know, um, and stuff like that. So sometimes, yeah, that happens. Unfortunately, you know, somebody picks on a family member, so the other family member needs to go defend, you know, the family. So, yeah. so I've, I even have done that when I've played with my sister in the right, past. Right. I've, uh... <laughs> yeah, your sister was like one of the first legit female hockey players around here. She, she was, was. There yeah. was only a few. There was. A, there was only like three or four girls playing way back then, and they were they varied in age and. um yeah, she, and she still plays. So, actually, oh really? Where's yeah. she playing at? She's playing down in Arizona. Okay. So she's living in Mesa. So, okay. Well, yeah. That's gonna bring us about to the midpoint. We'll just pause for a real quick break and uh, be right back with the Utah Puck Report. Okay, and back to the Utah Puck Report. Our special guest, Chris Billiter, co-host Evan Stofflet. Um, we're t- we're talking, we're we're discussing all the issues that we're having with officiating. And, uh, you know, basically it's, we're not having a a problem with officiating. We're having a problem getting officials. So what would you say to somebody that's wanting to become an official right now? Um, I would say do it. I, it's, it's great. It's a great experience. It gives way different perspective on the game. Um, you have a whole new appreciation for the game. I always joke with people saying, you know, it's, um, with my with my officiating over the years, when I'd be playing, guys would be saying that ref's making the wrong call, and I'd be like, "No, that's the right call. Yeah. You, you just don't know the rule there." So, it, it it gives a whole different perspective. So, I would encourage. I it, I think it's a great part time job. Um, I I think every I think everybody should try it, um, and um, I think it, it gives you a different respect for officials as well. I yeah, mean, it, know, it has to. Yeah. The best way to learn is to teach, right? And the best way to understand officials is to become an official. Agreed. The best coach I ever played for and one of the best people I've ever known is J.P. Parisi. And he told me a long time ago, uh, first off, before you ever open your mouth to an official, you better have read the entire book. And he made us all read the book. And then he also told me, uh, don't get mad at the officials. Just be glad they're there. Uh, be glad they're going to drop the puck and maybe make some right calls and maybe make some wrong calls. But you're going to make some right plays and make some wrong plays on the ice too. Nobody's perfect. Just if they blow the whistle and stop the play, get the puck, drop the puck, and maybe get your offsides, perfect. That's good enough. Just be glad they're there. And that's that's always been I, – I, I maybe lost sight of that for a little while, but it's, it's always been a good guide. And reading the book and understanding the rules is a big part of that too. So – and I was the idiot that when my daughter was playing basketball, 
I didn't know the rules. I was just going off what the other people were yelling. And so I thought I knew the rules. And I'm sitting I'm sitting next to a guy that used to be a quarterback for the U. And our daughters are on the same team. And I'm like, well, he's an athlete. He must know what he's talking about. And I'm yelling, like, whatever. And finally, one of the refs came over to me. He was also a fireman. He's like, hey, Jay, you know that's not the rule, right? And I'm like, over the back's not a rule? He's like, no, it's not. A, if they make contact, then it's still a common foul. But you can still jump over and reach over and, and pull the ball. And, and it's like, anyway, it was just like he explained the rule to me. And I'm like, well, that's not the way we understand it in the stands. So, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it's uh, if you don't know the rules, you're just making a, a fool of yourself. But um, I want to talk about what if I'm 35 years old? It'd be nice to be 35 again. What if I was 35 years old and I was like, I want to get into hockey. And I've never played, but it looks cool. I went to the Grizzlies games. I saw Evan Stofflet wheel around there and, uh, you know, could check from behind and blow his shoulder out. <laughs> But I want to do that. What? How do I? How do I start if I'm a, an adult? That's a really good question. Um, we we at the Acord Ice Center and Sully County, the County Ice Center also runs one. Um, but we run adult learn to play classes. Usually do them in the spring, summer, and the fall. Usually run two or three classes. They're usually six week classes, and um, that's a great way to start. We kind of go over the basics, kind of teach skating, you know, stick handling, shooting, all the some basic team concepts, and um, try to get. Uh, adults ready to play and then they they move on to playing in adult league you know whatever league that is that they feel like they're best suited for okay with their abilities what about equipment do you you guys just send them all to don Korth if they're just starting or how do you um yes um i also do get some donated gear as well so sometimes i'm able to hook people up as well so i'll get people that'll donate gear to the rink and um i'll hook them up as well so that or Don, or they go out and they, they buy them from the local hockey shops or online. Yeah. You know, a lot of people order stuff online these days if they know their sizes. Right. So I really, I discourage them from buying skates online unless they've gone into a hockey shop and been properly fitted. Yeah. Because you really want to get a good good pair of skates. If you're going to, I always tell people when you're buying gear that the two most important pieces of equipment that you should spend the most money on is your skates and your helmet. Oh, yeah. Everything else can be middle of the road, but you you should buy what you can afford with skates and what you can afford with your helmet because you got got to take care of the noggin, yeah. you know, and and you want a good pair of skates that'll give you good support and you'll have a good experience in. Yeah, I honestly I don't know. Like even though my skates right now are like the magic slippers, right? They're but they're a thousand bucks. But I think almost any time if you are just breaking in skates or if you've never been in skates it's going to be miserable and it's almost like like we tell people with hot yoga you got to try it one time isn't enough like go three or four times and break in the skates or get used to the skates and get used to how much ankle power that takes or ankle strength whatever uh wouldn't you agree evan like i would say if you're just starting do not buy top of the line skates for one the cost factor two they're going to be way stiffer there there's a lot less wiggle room and you can get away with a softer skate, which will help you be able to, you know, get that forward flexion and all that. So stay away from the vapor. I don't know what numbers they have now or the top of the line skates. Yeah. <laughs> Just get a yeah. good, yeah, a get good a, skate, though. Yeah, buy at least at least a middle of the road what you can afford. So because if you buy a cheap skate, you're going to be buying another skate soon and you don't want to you don't want to do that. So so buy something that's got good support and some good steel in it. You should be good to go. And get out there, right? Yeah. I, so yeah. many people tell me, they're like, ah, like, especially with firemen. It's It's been crazy how many firefighters have eventually started and then really gotten into it. And a lot of it's if they work with me and you, they see I'm obsessed with hockey and I watch it all the time and then they start to understand the rules and they want to play and they get out and they start playing. And they're like, why didn't I do this before? And I was like, well, I was telling you, Evan, when I just started playing the guitar, I'm like, why didn't I... I'm sick of not knowing how to play the guitar. I love music. That's why I work in rock radio. Why don't I know how to play a song on the guitar? And then, you know, you just have to start. And it sucks because when you start, you suck. You're not going to be good. And you just have to accept that part and accept that you're not going to throw down Tesla off the off the get-go, right? You ha- Or you're not going to throw a, you know, you're not McGregor out there. You're not uh, McDavid. You're not... Uh, you know, for me, you're not Jonathan Quick. You're not, you know, ever. 
but <laughs> it's okay to go out there and suck. Yeah, that's the fun. Yeah, Just yeah. getting better yeah, in you the, know, the battle. The en- the enthusiasm I see from people that are learning something new, and and I mean. What, what the, one of the best parts of my job is is seeing the joy that people get from learning and growing and, and having fun. And, oh. you know, especially when I hear that from them, you know, like I'm like and, – and, and that's why I do my job. That's, that's the reason I love my job is, is that service that I'm providing for, for these individuals, these people, you know, whatever. Um, I love that. I mean the excitement. I mean the joy. I mean no. it changes people's lives. I, I had a, a mother just recently um, within the last week. Um, her son, her son's been involved in hockey at our out at Acord for a little while, and she was telling me that you know, um, and he has some issues. She said that the doctor said what changed with him, and she said he started playing hockey, and she says she and she started thanking thanking me for providing the program that we have and I'm just like and she was in tears telling me and I'm just like almost in tears crying you know almost just yeah. it's like wow I'm like but I and I and I told her I said this is why I love my job you know because you know hopefully if I can make if I can make an impact in one person's life yeah. you know that it goes a long ways it's people so, underestimate that too and I, I posted a thing on the Utah Puck Report Facebook page just this morning that just says uh don't underestimate the value of hockey in somebody's life just because they're not good enough or they don't want to play college or juniors or whatever don't underestimate the fact that it could have saved their life you know whatever sport it is but i know for a fact i probably would not have gone to college had i not wanted to play hockey i would have just been a radio dj and and done that and that it changed my life that way it changed my life it gave me uh, a lot of like the friends i have are all from hockey basically so um, yeah playing sports can really change your life Evan, you made dozens of dollars. Yeah, all over the world. All I over mean, the world. It, That's the cool part, right? Like, you played everywhere. It paid for my bachelor's degree. It paid for my master's degree. I've lived all over Asia, Europe, Eastern Europe, North America. Like, I'm, yeah, pretty sweet. You lived uh, where Dracula's from. Uh, Transylvania, Transylvania, yeah. Transylvania. I, I could not think of it all of a sudden. Right outside. <laughs> uh, I was in Transylvania right outside Dracula's castle. So, yeah. And playing in China. Played in China. The league was Japan, South Korea, Russia, so always traveling around everywhere. And, you know, we'd get time off, so I was able to branch out to a bunch of other countries. And, yeah. We've got pictures of you on the on the Great Wall. Mm-hmm. And, yeah, I mean, what an amazing experience all brought to you by hockey. Yeah. Yeah, incredible. All right, now the real reason you're in here. Let's. I got a two-year-old grandson. Yeah. And it's it's. I figure it's about time. How, let's talk about youth hockey. How okay. do I? Where do I start with my two-year-old grandson? What's out there for for youth nowadays with youth hockey? For for a two-year-old uh, that gets, uh, usually most learn to play programs are three. So I'm right waiting. Now, Count right, the days. Right, right now, just just get him out and keep it fun. You know, with the youngins, I tell people if you get them out there for five or ten minutes and they had a great experience, it's okay. Don't don't feel like they have to be out there for forty five minutes to an hour. They're getting scouted already. They're just yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, allow them that you know that's just their age. That's the attention span. Okay. You know, for a two year old, you probably have about two minutes or whatever you're doing, and then they're 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 ready to do something different. Yeah. And it kind of goes that way going up. So you got a five year old, you got about five minutes on a on a drill or whatever you're doing, and then they're ready to move on. All right. So, and so how now if he's three and I want to get him. What do I what do I do? Where do I bring them? How do you guys so take care of this? We offer learn to skate program. Okay. Out, out at Acor, well, the county, at all three rinks, we offer um, learn to skate, and, um, and and everybody has to start with learn to skate, no matter who your dad is. Is that right? <laughs> we, we we recommend learn to skate. So yeah. yes. So um, there That's are important. there are <laughs> there are a few exceptions to the rules. You know, you might get you might get somebody that mom and dad was teaching or something like that, or you know whoever. And they might be be able to bypass learn to skate and jump into a learn to play hockey program. But well, I got to tell you, I, I bring that up not not for me, like because you know Tegan did uh, learn to skate as well, and I thought it was great because I don't know how to skate. I, I've been playing for forty I'm years. Stop the puck. I don't know how to <laughs> skate. Yeah, I can't skate. I can't stop the puck. What I can do is buy really nice gear, and it looks good. It would be nice if I knew how to use it, but. Um, I, I heard a thing about Joe Sackick and uh, Peter Forsberg, 
when they were in Colorado. It was the same thing. Their county was like, oh, you want your kids to play? They got to start learning to skate. And Peter Forsberg was like, my kid's been skating since, like, before he could walk. And they're like, it doesn't matter. Sign him up. And in the long run, they both said, you know what? That was a good idea. That was, it was good to have somebody else coach him and teach him how to skate. And, but anyway, that's why I brought that up. I just, it's important. Like, get him out there, learn to skate, let somebody else teach him. I, I agree. I mean, now I couldn't get either one of my kids to play hockey, but they did other things. And in those sports, I would help coach, but I tried not to coach my kids. I usually would tell whoever else was coaching, you coach my kids. Um, because it's always hard when it's a, a parent coaching a child because we tend to be harder on our kids yeah. than we should be. And so it's it's better if you can have somebody else teach your kid. Um, I think they need that experience. It's not, I mean, you should you should be involved if you if you can be, but it's better if you coach other kids and let somebody else coach your kid. You agree with that, Evan? I mean, that's kind of the philosophy behind Wasatch Renegades, right? Like, Yeah, I mean, I think younger is a little different when they're small, um, but I know I get a lot of feedback that people are happy at our the level that I'm coaching at that it's not a dad coach and because it just it adds to potential issues or why was that decision made where yeah. when you don't have a horse in the race it's pretty easy to lay out okay well I, this is the reason and this was the consequence this was whatever yeah yeah and I and, and I saw fair amount of that growing up you know with with just not having as many travel teams and you know dad's coaching teams and you know certain players would play more than others because of the politics and everything else so sometimes i think it's better not having a parent coaching a child especially when they get older yeah 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 so. i agree i agree and in some situations there's there's not a better option just because a lot of people don't volunteer to especially in those the free leagues or whatever, right? Your coaches aren't being paid. You got to get whatever. But yeah, it, it, it's nice that you have that option with learn to skate. Those people are taught how to teach people how to skate. That's their job is to teach those C cuts and whatnot and let them get out there and, and figure that out for the first time. And the kids probably think it's fun to have a coach for the first time when they're three, four years old. It's 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 a good relationship to build. Um, Chris, is there anything you want to say about the upcoming season? Anything you'd like to tell all the all the youth league players and all the men's league players as as the season approaches um have fun you know respect respect the players respect the coaches respect the referees respect the game and, yeah. respect the game yeah and have fun awesome and, and enjoy it you know and and don't be afraid to share it with other people that's a great message spread the word uh before we go and I guess I just broke it to you. Uh, I, we just have to mention the passing of a, uh, a legendary Salt Lake Golden Eagle. Lyle Bradley passed away last week. Um, he was, I believe he was late 80s in his age, but uh, peacefully passed away, and it was expected. And um, it's just, it was an honor for me to have the opportunity to play for him when I was at the club with the University of Utah. And the impact he had... And this market in hockey, you said you had experience with it. Yes. Um, so I, I, Wild Bradley was always was was my kind of like growing up with the Golden Eagles. He was my favorite player. My favorite number to wear was eleven because he wore eleven. And um, I had interactions with Lyle over the years, even after he retired and everything else. Um, he knew our family. And, um, he was a great guy. Yeah. Um, so very sad, very sad. Yeah, you know, it's sad. It's um, I'm glad he lived a long and, and productive life, and I'm more than thankful for what he what he did for this market and what he did for the game. We talked about respect the game. Like he was just a a champion for the sport. Did you ever get a chance to meet him? Or no, nope, never met him. Oh, that's something that the Grizzlies should really take more opportunity to do too. Is I think every former Salt Lake Golden Eagle that lives here, because we still got Kevin Guy and, and some great people here. I think they should yeah. be ambassadors for the Utah Grizzlies and all the younger players, well, when you were a younger player coming through, now that you're a retired vet. <laughs> but you guys should have had a chance to meet these guys, these legends, and um, we do have it lined up. We're going to have Theron Fleury on the show uh, within the next couple of weeks. To me, that's why I wore number nine, um, which was a really odd number for a goalie. I found out later. Go ahead. <laughs> I, I met Theron Fleury before he ever played a game for the Golden Eagles. Really? Yeah. Um, my family owned an auto shop builder, Auto Repairs. You probably remember that years yep. ago. Um, we used to do a lot of mechanical work on a lot of the Golden Eagles cars at the time. Um, 
And um, one day a Mustang shows up in our in our lot, and three three Golden Eagle players get out. Well, Theron hadn't played a game yet, but got out and I took look one look at him and I thought, "You're going to play, you know, you're going to play pro <laughs> hockey." <laughs> Little did I know he'd go on to play in the NHL and have quite the career he did. But I met that was a, that was my first meeting. He'd never played a game for the Golden Eagles at that point. They were looking for a car to buy, see if we had anything. And yeah, there was had tons of money to spend on it. Yeah. So anyway. Yeah, I had like 96 points in 40 games here yeah. or something. Unreal. Like, yeah. Unreal. And like one of probably the probably the best player to ever play here. I, maybe Joey Mullen. Like we've had some really good players yeah. come through here, but Theron's a legend. And if you follow him on social media, you can see that he's very entertaining. Not None of it's appropriate for KSL content. <laughs> <laughs> and so it'll be a pretty interesting interview to see if we can uh, keep him in KSL sports lane there but he's a very entertaining guy and has a ton of experience and if you followed his story at all he's got like obviously some some serious issues he had to work through and has really helped uh, other players avoid those issues and change the game so that's just more stuff we have coming up and just talking about uh, the importance of guys like Lyle Bradley for this market it's it's uh, rest in peace Lyle we all appreciate everything you've done um, Evan we appreciate you coming out thanks for having me look forward to uh being, I guess, more of a mainstay yeah. in the future. Yeah, yeah. And we're going to get some more out of you. And like I said, we're going to really break down everything that's that's going on in travel team hockey. Uh, we'll try to get some more travel team, the other travel to the Eagles and Junior Grizzlies. I think there's some more teams out of Provo. Uh, also coming up this season, we're going to talk to all the the Junior A teams here. We've got, uh, we're going to almost have a weekly talk with Ryan Kanasiewicz and Tegan Zahn about what's going on with the Grizzlies. All the drama going on with the Grizzlies and the Mason Manic trade. And we're going to touch all of it because the Grizzlies did not want to lose Mason Manic. And Mason Manic did not want to leave the market. And now he's thinking about just hanging him up because he's he didn't want to leave the market. He's married. He's got a, an established life here. And he's he's been traded to Cincinnati. And it, the Grizzlies tried everything they could to prevent that trade. It's a great spot. Cincinnati? Since he's fun. You know, had some road trips there. You can you can bend Mason's ear. <laughs> we'll try to get that set up for next week. We're also going to talk to his parents about raising a kid in this market that was clearly going to go out of the market, and how many people said they could help him, and how much money that cost them, and where the real opportunities lay with travel team. I think that's something you can yeah really uh, participate in and, and lend some guidance, Chris. Thank you so much for finally being able to come on. I know there was a ton of hoops to jump with the county and. Uh, as an accounting employee before, I was never allowed to talk to the media until I was a PIO. So I get it. I don't know if they made you go through a PIO class. No, they they were they were they were they were good about it. So they okay. all, they all uh, gave me uh, gave me a thumbs up, gave me some guidelines, and uh, so I'm, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me on. And well, thanks for um, everything you do for hockey, man. Like it's like, like we like I told you, I I just want to grow the game. I know that you're in there. You're in the trenches, growing the game every day, and you. You're helping all the kids every day, and you're helping uh, 35-year-old men learn how to play hockey. It's just the opportunities to grow the sport, and what a, what a game we have, and, and thank you for all you do for it. Oh, thank you. It's a, it's, a, it's a blessing to have the job I have. Yeah, so. you're look, I, I would really like your job at some point, maybe. Probably not, though. I don't know if I have the patience for it. <laughs> anyway, all right, so that's it. That's, that's the Utah Public Report Season 5, Episode 1, in the can. Hey!